So the CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. And um, I did my entire PhD dissertation on this fluid at Harvard Medical School. And essentially the way that it came up was that, um, believe it or not, I thought that I wanted to do research on cancer. And I was in a cancer lab and I was not so happy, let's say, in the cancer lab. And my wife says, she comes to me and says, uh, you know, I don't think you're very happy doing what you're doing. I think you need to sort of shift. Let's take a, some, a break. And so we took a break and went to Santa Fe together. And she wanted to study polarity therapy, which is a holistic healthcare system. And in one of the classes, uh, we were learning um, some craniosacral techniques. And the teacher said, uh, you know, you're working here with the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is one molecule away from seawater. And I said, well, that's interesting. Like, Seawater is an interesting, you know, compound. We have this fluid inside of us that's one molecule away from seawater. So that night I go home and I start kind of reading up on the cerebrospinal fluid and I realize that there was very little known about this fluid. Very little known about this fluid. It was thought of sort of providing a couple nutrients um, and sort of buoyancy and protection to the central nervous system. So as we go throughout the training of our, our, our polarity, um, you know, I'm starting to think about going back to Harvard to finish my PhD or to actually to start it. And so I left all the cancer stuff behind and started a lab that was able to actually investigate the question, what is the cerebrospinal fluid? And so in us, in all of us, we have 150 mils, milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid in our brain, inside of our brain, covering the outside of our brain, within the central canal of our spinal cord and around our spinal cord. 150 milliliters is equivalent of almost like half a, a, a can of Sprite or Coca-Cola. Every day it turns over about three to four times. So that means you make 500 milliliters, which is half a liter of cerebrospinal fluid a day. So we're all making this fluid and it's bathing our entire brain. It's bathing all the insides of our brain, the outsides of our brain, the central canal, the spinal cord actually has a central canal that is bathed completely with CSF all the way down the spinal cord. And the CSF goes, and it actually goes all the way outside the spinal cord, all the way down to the sacrum. So what we wanted to do is essentially ask the question, you know, what does the cerebrospinal fluid do? And so we did some experiments. We were the first to analyze uh, very, very uh, descriptively human embryonic cerebrospinal fluid and we compared it to rat embryonic cerebrospinal fluid. And the reason why we did that was because I looked at some sections of some embryos, and I saw that in these sections, the cerebrospinal fluid space, the space in these sections was ginormous. It was huge. But the developing brain was this little tiny sliver, and inside was this huge space. And you know, I actually turned to my colleague and I said, you know, there seems like there's something missing here. And, 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 and he goes, well, no, that's actually, you know, that's where the choroid plexus is, which makes the cerebrospinal fluid. And I said, wow, all that is fluid? Well, what does that do? So first we wanted to analyze what were the, you know, what actually was in the fluid. And then we wanted to see um, what does a fluid do from a developmental perspective. And so we kind of did some experiments where we, mitched, we, 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 um, we mixed and matched certain sort of developmentally staged brains with different developmentally staged CSFs to see what does the CSF actually provide to the, to the developing brain. And interestingly, what we found out was, well, first of all, you know, just anatomically, every single neural stem cell in development, which, is, which, are, the cell, which are the cells that develop into neurons to create the entire central nervous system, every single one of those stem cells at one point in development makes contact with the CSF or is contacting the CSF. So early on in development, you're actually making contact with the, the, these cells are making contact with the CSF. There's various cues and growth factors and molecules that are actually released into the CSF that instruct the developing brain on proliferation. How much do I actually need to expand, for instance? Um, differentiation. When should a cell that's a neural stem cell leave the sort of niche that it's in and go out and become a neuron so it can function and it can have a more specialized function. And so we essentially categorized the embryonic 
um, cerebrospinal fluid in humans, as well as we did an extensive analysis in, in, uh, in, in, in rats, looked at all the proteins, looked at how they changed and varied with time, and what were some of the functions of that. And what we published was essentially that the cerebrospinal fluid creates a, a niche for stem cells and provides information based on the molecules that are actually in the cerebrospinal fluid, provides information, information to the brain for proliferation or differentiation. And so that was kind of our major, you know, that was kind of our major uh, finding with, uh, with, with my, my PhD work. So in back of that then was, you know, all this kind of interesting training from polarity therapy and craniosacral therapy of this fluid actually having sort of a spiritual component. And during my PhD thesis, one of the books I read was actually the Tibetan book of Living and Dying by Soigal Rinpoche. And he actually describes this practice. It's a, it's a POA practice and it's done, um, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Buddhist meditation practice where uh, you, essentially it's done at the time of death and it's transferring one's consciousness to the unified Buddha consciousness. And there's a couple sort of indicators that you are successful in the practice. One of which is a tingling at the top of the head. Another one is headache. Uh, one is a small little hole appears on the top of the head where a, a blade of grass can be put into it. The other one is a softening of the fontanelle, uh, which is, which is where the where where all the bones of the skull come together when we're when we're when we're babies that's there's sort of a space there and you can actually push on it and that's actually you're pushing on the cerebrospinal fluid and so in, in when somebody dies that space actually softens and um and you might have a little bit of clear fluid that actually comes out from the from the head and so i said wow is that cerebrospinal fluid. You know, if this is a successful practice of transferring your consciousness to the Buddha consciousness, and one of the indicators of success in that practice is a clear fluid that emanates from the top of the head, could that actually be cerebrospinal fluid? Because that's the only clear fluid that's present at that. So uh, we actually tried a little bit to get some fluid from practitioners who did this practice, and we weren't able to do that. Um, but um, you know, those thoughts were kind of in the back of our, of, 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 of at least my awareness and consciousness when I was doing this work. Um, combined with sort of my craniosacral training, you know, it became a very powerful, it became a very powerful fluid. And I started doing uh, with my, with the guidance from my wife and some of my teachers and stuff like that, some meditations on the cerebrospinal fluid. So for instance, you know, just anatomically, you know, um, we have a third ventricle, which is essentially like right, like if you go ear, you know, mid ear length, straight line, and then uh, midline, right in between your brow, there's a fluid filled space. It's in the midline, it's called the third ventricle. Just in front of the third ventricle is the pituitary gland. Just in back of the third ventricle is the pineal gland. Okay, both those glands are contacting the the third ventricle. This third ventricle then opens up, it goes up into the lateral ventricles, which are on either side of the brain, and it goes down all the way the central canal of your spinal cord, okay? In Kundalini yoga practices and traditions, they describe a hollow canal in the center of the spinal cord where the Kundalini rises and essentially brings the, you know, the awakening of the Kundalini or this primal energy to the third chakra where then it goes up to the crown chakra and an awakening occurs. The caduceus, for instance, is the midline. So the staff of the caduceus is sort of like a, a, a midline. And the two sides of the caduceus are depictions of three of the or two of the channels from this yogic practice, which would be the pingala on one side, the right side, ida on the other side, the left side, and they cross. And at each crossing with the shashumna, they make a chakra. The meeting of the heads, which are the heads of the serpent, come together at the midline and they come right at the third eye. In my belief, the heads of the snake represent the, uh, one head of the snake represents the pineal gland, the other head of the snake represents the pituitary gland, and the center 
is the shishumna, which is the cerebrospinal fluid. When they come and meet together, it's sort of this meeting of the three energies right in the center here. Uh, you know, the third eye, sort of the eye of the soul. Um, this place has been called the Crystal Palace. It's been called the Cave of Brahma. And so from that space, then, um, it is, it, is, it is my belief that, you know, and, and, and some other people's belief as well, that there might be a physical manifestation of the sensation of I am, our beingness, at that space, when these energies come and combine, that we have this sort of sensation of beingness. And the reason I say that is because the I am is a fluid. The I am can transmit, or excuse me, the... Um, the cerebrospinal fluid is, is, is a fluid. The fluid is known to transmit light. It can transmit vibration. It can transmit flow, so flow from the fluid, and it can even translate molecules. So if there's sort of uh, an experience of a unified experience that you're having, the cerebrospinal fluid bathing all the areas of the brain that it bathes, has no synapses that it actually has to go through. If a certain message, let's say, is dispersed throughout the fluid, it can go to all the major control centers of the brain. It can be done totally non-synaptically, and it can be, have this whole synchronized effect on the brain because it's sort of, it's bathing the entire central nervous system.